Well, good morning and uh, welcome everyone. <clears throat> also welcome those who are following from the, from the live stream. And um, the title of this session is 20 years of imperialist meddling in Afghanistan. But I think that I will uh, have to deal with a bit more of the history of Afghanistan, which I think is necessary uh, in order to understand what's happened, what's happening now and what's happened over the last 20 years. Now, uh, I wanted to start with a quote, uh, just to warm the meeting up a bit, just to see if anyone knows who said the following, the likelihood there's going to be Taliban overrunning everything and owning the whole country is highly unlikely. We provided our Afghan partners with all the tools, let me emphasize, all the tools, training and equipment of any modern military. Joe Biden, yes, price for the comrade at the front. Uh, but not only Joe Biden said this very categorically, let me emphasize this, all the tools. Uh, he said this uh, one month, one month, four weeks before the Taliban took over Kabul and, and ended this, uh, this uh, particular defeat of US imperialism. He also said there is not going to be a situation where civilians are going to be evacuated with helicopters from the roof of the U.S. Embassy, as in Saigon. And this is exactly what happened on, on, the, on the 15th of, of August. So much uh, for the most powerful imperialist power on Earth, which the United States is still, still is. But nevertheless, there's no, way of, uh, there's no other way of describing this than a major defeat for U.S. imperialism, a major defeat which has uh, very uh, wide-ranging consequences, will, will have. Um, here's a quote from an American uh, US newspaper. I think it's from the, the Atlantic. And they describe the cost of the war. Obviously, they put the cost of the war from the perspective of the United States. But it's interesting what they, what they say. It says, in the 20 years since September the 11th, 2001, the United States has spent more than two trillion on the war in Afghanistan. Other estimates uh, are higher than that, three trillion, some, some people say. That's 300 million dollars per day, every day, for two decades, or 50,000 dollars for each of Afghanistan's 40 million people. Imagine this, just, just to put it into, into perspective. There have been 2,500 U.S. military deaths in Afghanistan and nearly 4,000 more of U.S. civilian contractors. Uh, I, this war has been conducted largely by uh, U.S. civilian contractors, i.e. mercenary organizations, uh, which have uh, played a major role in every U.S. war in the, in the, la in the recent uh, period. That pales beside the estimated 69,000 Afghan military and police killed, 47 civilians killed, plus 51,000 dead opposition fighters. But obviously, dead opposition fighters can mean anything, can mean also civilians killed in, in indiscriminate bombing of uh, villages, valleys, and, uh, and towns. And this is obviously just from the US perspective, as, as Mike Hogan said. Uh, probably the figure is much higher of people who died in the last 20 years. 250,000 uh, is one figure that's been, that's been given. And all of this, th this is the point that this American U US newspaper is making. All of this for what? For nothing. They haven't achieved any of their war aims. They have left the country defeated. Uh, uh, admittedly, it's, it's not a direct military defeat in a direct military confrontation. But that never happens in, in a country like Afghanistan, uh, which is known by, by some authors, described it as the graveyard of empires. So there's a long tradition of this in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. If there is one thing that the Afghan people will not tolerate is a foreign invader or a puppet government regime of a foreign invader. Now, of course, we have to say that uh, the, the, this is a major defeat for U.S. imperialism, but uh, it's also a victory for the Taliban, which is an extremely reactionary uh, force, which we, we have no sympathies uh, for. But you need to try to understand why 
why and how such a thing has happened. And, and the reason is clear that the, the regime that was imposed by US military invasion 20 years uh, ago was a, was a regime based on foreign domination. About 80% of the state budget was in foreign uh, aid. Uh, a regime that was extremely corrupt. As we've seen, the, the Afghan army was supposed to have, was it 300,000 uh, troops? Where, where were these troops in the final offensive of the Taliban? They all melted. All these generals and army officers made deals with the Taliban, went over with uh, all their equipment and their soldiers. Uh, uh, the, the, the army completely melted. Uh, in fact, this army was only in place because of, uh, of uh, corruption, because they were being paid large amounts of money to pretend they had an, an army and a, and a police. The whole, the whole system worked in this way and did not benefit ordinary working people, peasants, the women, and, and the children of Afghanistan, one single, one single uh, uh, iota. And, and only this, this regime was also based on years, decades of aerial bombardment uh, at the beginning with B-52s uh, from great uh, height, which completely, is completely indiscriminate. Uh, not only this, but then later on, it was based on drone strikes. Uh, from the comfort of someone's uh, computer room, these um, machines of war were being flown over villages in Afghanistan, killing everyone, uh, bombing uh, weddings. Uh, and this happened right until the end. If you, if you remember, one of the last US uh, strikes in Afghanistan killed a whole family of, of 10 people, including children, women, men, everyone was in that house who had nothing to do with, with anything. Uh, I, supposedly in, a, in an attempt to take out some ISIS uh, uh, fighters which, which weren't there. And this is the character of this regime. And this explains why this regime fell without any resistance, without anyone wanting to risk their lives to defend this, this regime. The minute the United States announced a timetable for withdrawal, this regime was finished and the Taliban started advancing throughout the country, the regime completely uh, uh, melted. Of course, the high-ranking officials of this regime, the president, the ministers, the generals, they all went into safe uh, and comfortable exiles, some of them to uh, uh, the Gulf states, some others to Tajikistan, Pakistan, neighboring uh, countries, and some others, they just went over to the, to the Taliban, uh, one of the ministers, became the head of, poli the, one of the ministers of this uh, US puppet uh, regime of, uh, of Ghani, went over and became the head of police, the head of police for Kabul, for the Taliban. So, I mean, this is completely uh, uh, farcical. And this is the reason why this regime fell without anyone in, in, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. And people in Afghanistan know who the Taliban are. They were in power for a period of uh, time in the 1990s, for about five or six years. And uh, they know how reactionary they are. They know the consequences of their victory, but no one was prepared to fight uh, for this regime that was, that was falling. Uh, and this is quite significant, I would uh, say. But as I said before, in order to understand Afghanistan, today the situation uh, that's developed in the last 20 years is necessary to look at the history of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Afghanistan and also at the geography of Afghanistan, which plays a, a crucial role in, uh, in uh, politics. Afghanistan is now, is now presented as an as a extremely backward country of uh, religious fanatics. Uh, and there are religious fanatics in Afghanistan, there's no, no doubt. But Afghanistan has another side. Uh, great civilizations uh, emerge from that uh, uh, region. And Afghanistan also has a proud communist tradition, which I will describe in a, in a minute. Uh, it's not all black uh, uh, reaction and, and backward uh, tribes, though this also uh, exists. Uh, Afghanistan um, has the, the misfortune, if you want to call it like that, of be, being in a, in a very important geostrategic area, which is, which is the, the door or, or the passageway between uh, Central Asia and, uh, and South Asia. And this means that over the centuries, many different civilizations have passed, uh, have conquered uh, Afghanistan for short pe periods of time. They've been kicked out, and some of them have settled. And this has created a country which is a patchwork of different uh, nationalities, 
different uh, languages. In the, in the north and in the east, there are Turkmens, Uzbeks, Tajiks, which are related to neighboring uh, uh, countries. Uh, in the south and the west, uh, there's mainly the, the, the Pushtuns, who also uh, live in, over the border in, in Pakistan. This is a completely artificial border created by uh, British imperialism over the Durand line, which divides one people, the, Push, the Pashtun uh, people, in two different uh, countries, and which has created enormous, uh, is at the, back, uh, the background of many of these uh, conflicts. Uh, there are also different uh, languages. The main language of the administration and the cultured uh, layers is uh, Dari or Farsi, which is the same language as in Iran, or, or, or very close to the uh, Iranian uh, uh, main language in Iran. But then there is also Pashtun, which is spoken by large parts of the population, particularly in, in the south and in the, and in the west, particularly the poorer sections of, uh, of society, the most oppressed uh, uh, layers. And on top of this, there is also the Sunni Shia uh, division, which also plays a part in uh, Afghanistan, with the Hazara Shia, which are closely linked to uh, Iran, in a minority and being subject to ethnic cleansing by all sorts of regimes, by the regime that was in power up until now, by the Taliban over, over many uh, years. <clears throat> and so this, this is the, 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 the makeup of Afghanistan, which plays an important role in its, uh, in its politics. On top of this, uh, Afghanistan is an extremely mountainous uh, country with lots of small closed off uh, valleys, which are therefore very easy to, to defend, very difficult to, to conquer. There are, there are whole <coughs> mountain ranges, the Hindu Kush, the Pamir uh, mountains in, in the border with uh, China and, and so on. And for most of the 20th century, for, for most of the 19th century, sorry, Afghanistan was a buffer state between the Russian Empire and the British, uh, dom and the, and the British uh, uh, Empire. And, and it was uh, dominated by one or the other at different, uh, at different times, but, but it served as a contention, uh, a buffer zone between the, two, um, between the two empires. And the British fought three Afghan wars, trying to completely dominate this country, and they failed three times. Uh, Engels wrote about that in some interesting uh, uh, writings. As, as we know, Engels was very interested in, in military uh, affairs and military history, and he wrote about these three, three wars, which the British lost. <clears throat> By the beginning of the, of the 19th century, some interesting developments took place. This uh, whole region was uh, uh, the, the site of revolutions. There was a constitutional revolution in Iran, there was the 1905 revolution in uh, Russia and then the 1917 revolution in, uh, in Russia. But there was also a lot of nationalist ferment in the whole area of Central Asia, in Iran, in uh, Russia itself, in Turkey, which also plays a role in, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. There was, there was the Young Turks movement of Kemal uh, Ataturk, nationalist uh, movement trying to modernize these countries, trying to bring these countries from backwardness into modernization, uh, establishing uh, written languages, creating universities. And this had also an impact in Afghanistan, but in a very distorted uh, way, in a country where there was at that time no uh, capitalist class to speak of. Uh, it was an extremely backward country. Uh, it was the king, uh, a modernizing king, King uh, Amanullah, who declared independence, taking advantage of, of the Russian uh, revolution in 1919. Uh, and was inspired, uh, as I said, by the Russian Revolution and the Young Turks movement in, in, uh, in Turkey. And he tried to play Russia against Britain and introduce a whole series of uh, progressive reforms, including a constitution. He was then overthrown by reactionary forces backed by Britain. And here we see a pattern. Every time, homegrown forces have tried to modernize the country, introduce uh, progressive reforms, even basic democra democratic reforms, a constitution, uh, rights for women, and so on, they've been overthrown by reactionary forces which have always been backed by imperialist uh, powers throughout the 20th uh, century. You go a bit further. In 1965, 
we see the founding of the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the Communist uh, Party. Uh, but this party, unfortunately, was dominated by Stalinist ideas. They basically said that there were no conditions for socialism in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan. And therefore, Afghan socialists or communists, they had to support progressive forces. They had to unite, and, and this is a quote from the founding statement, they had to unite the workers, the peasants, and the progressive bourgeoisie. But uh, the problem is that in, uh, in Afghanistan, there wasn't any progressive bourgeoisie. There was barely a bourgeoisie to speak uh, uh, of. And so this, this uh, wrong strategy was to then uh, mark uh, a whole series of, of defeats for, for the communist uh, uh, movement in, in Afghanistan. In 1967, and this is interesting, this is important, it will have consequences, the, the, the Communist Party, the PDPA, split into several factions. There, there were quite a lot of them. And, and some of these factions were based on tribal allegiances or, or national uh, allegiances, but there were, there were also some political elements involved in it. The two main factions was the Hulk faction, a, the masses faction, after the name of the paper, which was led by two uh, leading figures, Nur Muhammad Tarakai and Hafizullah Amin. Amin and Tarakai were, were to become the main leaders of the Hulk uh, uh, faction of the Communist Party. And the Hulk faction was based in the poorer layers of uh, society, mainly amongst the Pushtun in the south and in the west. Uh, and it was a more radical faction of the, of the Communist uh, Party. They were, they were very impatient, they wanted to take over, uh, and they refused collaboration with, uh, with any, any other uh, forces. Meanwhile, the Parcham uh, faction, led by Babrak Karmal, uh, was based mainly in the urban areas, amongst the Dari speaking, uh, and to a certain extent amongst the northern uh, national groups, Uzbeks, Tajiks, and, and so on. It was a more moderate um, faction. Uh, Karmal himself came from the ruling class. He, he was the, the son of a, of a, of a very wealthy uh, person. But this is not unusual in a country like Afghanistan, extremely backward uh, country, elements of the intelligentsia, even the state apparatus, and even the, the ruling class can be attracted to uh, communist ideas, very radical ideas, by the fact that they can see the pover poverty, the suffering of the, of the people. And also at the same time, the Soviet Union was a model for, for them. I mean, th this is uh, Central Asia, is a region that has many close links with Afghanistan, and the, 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 the Russian Revolution had developed these uh, regions out of backwardness into developed industrial countries with uh, universities and so on. Also, for certain reasons, i.e. the reason of this, um, the, this uh, attempt, the, the, the fact that Afghanistan is between Russia and, and the British Empire, for most of the 20th century, the educated uh, layers in uh, Afghanistan went, many of them went to universities in uh, Moscow, in, in Russia, or in Central Asia, in Tashkent and other places. Uh, the, the king in the mid 20th century uh, was, was an ally of, uh, of Russia for a very long period of time, and they had military uh, aid. And many military officers in the, in the Afghan army were trained and educated in military academies in the Soviet Union. And this had an impact. For many of these military officers, of course, uh, the Soviet Union was a model. Soviet Union was a Stalinist country where there was no workers' democracy of any kind. But nevertheless, from the point of view of Afghan military officers who wanted to bring the country out of backwardness, it was a model to, to, to follow. Also, of course, this is another interesting detail, in the Soviet Union, military officers, the high-ranking echelons of the bureaucracy had lots of privileges. The, that, also, that was also something that uh, military officers in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan thought it was a good thing to, to, to emulate. So many of them joined communist uh, underground organizations within the army. There were a whole number of networks, some linked to the Hulk faction, some, li some linked to the other uh, Parcham uh, faction. In 1973, there was a coup against the king, and this is also very peculiar. The coup was carried out by the king's cousin, 
a, another person from the ruling, uh, from, from the royal uh, family, who then, Daoud, who then proceeded to declare a republic. So you see a, a, a prince who declares a republic. He was also some, somewhat a progressive uh, ruler who wanted to bring the country out of backwardness. He uh, declared a new constitution, uh, introduced uh, rights for women, uh, parliament, and so on. And he was backed by the Parcham faction of the Communist uh, Party. The Parcham said this is the representative of the progressive bourgeois. They made an alliance. And about half of the ministers in this government were members of the Parcham Communist uh, Party. But very soon, uh, Daoud showed his true colors. He was there not, not for communism or not for any progressive reforms. He was there for himself to advance his own uh, uh, interests. And he started relying on Pashtun nationalism, started agitating uh, around the idea of Pashtunistan, which obviously upset the, the Pakistani uh, ruling class, which at that time was, was a military dictatorship backed by the United States. And so from the very beginning, there was uh, an insurgency, a reactionary Islamic fundamentalist insurgency backed by Pakistan and the CIA against this so-called progressive uh, government. Even though two years into his government, 1975, uh, he completely changed tact. He arrested, he removed all the communist ministers from his government, arrested the Communist Party uh, leaders and proceeded uh, with rep repression against the communist uh, uh, movement, which is not a new thing. This happened time and again in, in, in colonial and former colonial uh, countries where communist parties followed this two-stage theory. First, we support the national uh, bourgeois, and then we can fight for socialism later on. And what usually happens is, first, they support the national bourgeois. These are big communist parties in Iraq, in uh, Sudan, uh, able to mobilize hundreds of thousands of workers and pe poor peasants. Uh, they brought these regimes into power, and the first thing these regimes did, military regimes in, in the main, uh, progressive army officers, was to turn against the Communist Party, because the Communist Party had an independent base of support and was a threat, potential threat, to these rulers. This happened in, in Iraq, happened in Sudan two or three times, uh, and it also happened in Afghanistan, of course. But this, this then provoked a different, uh, a different um, configuration. Uh, as Daoud moved to suppress the PDPA, uh, both wings, then the PDPA unified under, under pressure from the Indian Communist Party and the, and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. They unified again. It was, it was a united party, though the factions remained. 1977, the party was becoming uh, stronger. And then in 1978, in April, the, the Daoud regime moved against the communists again, arrested the main leaders of both uh, factions. And this was, the, 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 they killed one of the main leaders of the Communist uh, Party, a man by the name of Mir. And, he, and, and then this was the trigger for mass demonstrations against the regime and a military coup on the 27th of April 1970, 1978. Uh, the, the Communist factions within the army organized takeover of, uh, of power. And this is the Saur uh, revolution, the spring revolution that brought the PDPA to power. The, this, uh, I mean, I don't have time to go into all the details of the Saur revolution, but this was quite a sight. Columns of tanks led by communist-inspired uh, generals entering the presidential palace and removing, uh, and removing Dawood from, uh, from office. Um, this, this was, and this is another interesting point, important point, this was carried out mainly by the Hulk faction, and the Soviet Union knew nothing about this. This was not a, US, a Soviet Union-inspired uh, coup, as, as the West then uh, claimed. It was a homegrown uh, movement out of, triggered by the repression of the Daoud uh, uh, regime. And uh, the Hulk faction had not informed the, the Soviet Union. There were the Soviet agents, uh, KGB agents, there was Soviet embassy. In Kabul, they knew nothing. In fact, they had been advising the Communist Party to collaborate with uh, Daoud, to moderate their language and their demands, and not to implement any socialist uh, measures. They said, Afghanistan is not ready for socialism, which we're going to discuss in a minute, 
but they said Afghanistan is not ready for socialism, therefore you have to support uh, Dawood. This was the policy of the Soviet Union. So this is an important point. The Soviet Union had nothing to do with this uh, revolution, which took the form of a, of a, military, uh, of a military coup. The Saud Revolution immediately uh, took a whole series of progressive uh, measures. They, for instance, abolished uh, the dowry and, and the sale of uh, women into marriage, which was a very important uh, uh, change. They abolished all debts of the poor peasants to the landlords. They started, uh, and this was an also another very important uh, uh, part of their program, because most of the poor peasants were bonded to the semi-feudal landlords through debts. Uh, that's for the crops, for sowing, and, and so on. Uh, they they uh, applied, uh, they implemented a literacy campaign, and, and, and so on. So this was an extremely, a, a program of extremely progressive measures in what was in reality a very backward uh, country. You have to think that in uh, 1978, Afghanistan had 15 million inhabitants in a massive territory, this is a big country, uh, but only 15% lived in cities, uh, so the majority, the overwhelming majority of the population was rural. 10% were nomads, so they were not even uh, settled, they were nomad uh, herders, uh, crossing over state lines uh, as they wished. And 95% of the population were illiterate. So this is the, the scale of the task that they faced. That they faced. Now, there is a debate to be had. So some people say that the PDPA in power went too far and too quick in their, in their reforms. And this, this alienated the overwhelmingly rural uh, population, which was then under the spell or under the, the, the influence of reactionary Muslim uh, clerics. And, and this was the reason why there was a, an insurgency against uh, them, and they, and they lost control, and they were based mainly in, in small pockets in the cities. There is a certain element of truth in that. I mean, e even if a genuine communist uh, organization based on the ideas of Marxism had taken power in Afghanistan, the situation would have been extremely complicated, extremely, extremely difficult. And they did make some mistakes. I will say the main mistake they did was that they took on, uh, they took on religion head on. In a country like Afghanistan, you cannot do that. Uh, re religion cannot be attacked head on. Religion has to be attacked through rear guard action by removing the power of the, of the clerics through agrarian reform, through the literacy campaign, and, and so on, to so taking democratic uh, measures, undermine the, the ideological power of uh, religion rather than clashing head on with religion. For instance, it's said that Amin liked to, liked to drink in public and boast about his drinking. This was very offensive to many people in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Many people who were poor peasants and, and poor people who could have been won over to the revolutionary movement with a more cautious approach. Um, and, this, and this was one of their mistakes. Also, they introduced many of these measures. This was a revolution that took place through a military coup. This was not a democratic movement of the, of the masses, although obviously they had support mainly in the, in the cities. So these people at the top, they took a whole number of measures by decree, without uh, explanation, without a political uh, debate, without, without political work amongst the, the masses. This was another mistake. For instance, many of these measures were taken before the literacy campaign had even started. It would have been probably better, strategically, to start the literacy campaign uh, and have a political education campaign throughout the country to the most remote villages explaining what the government was doing in relation to agrarian reform, the debts, uh, the abolition of the marriage, uh, the bride price, and, and so on. And this was not done. This was a bureaucratic regime that acted from the top in a very clumsy way. However, this is not the full story. The full story is that already there was a reactionary Islamic insurgency. And this reactionary Islamic insurgency didn't just happen uh, spontaneously. This was organized, funded, and backed 
by reactionary imperialist uh, forces, starting with Pakistan. Obviously, as Pakistan has started this campaign already under the Daoud regime because they were worried about all this agitation about Pashtunistan. Uh, but also then, and the ISI, secret services in Afghanistan played a major role in, uh, in this. But also then, backed by Saudi Arabia, extremely reactionary uh, feudal theocracy, and backed by the CIA. Not, not from 1978, not from 1979 when the Soviet Union uh, invaded, but from the 1970s, from, from after, from 1975 specifically. When they would started talking about, about um, when they would started talking about Pashtunistan. And this also took place at a very particular time. This was uh, in 1978, 79, Angola, had a had, uh, communist uh, guerrilla take power. Uh, there was, uh, there was a, a revolution in Iran where a, a US-backed regime was overthrown. This is a completely different story. We, we don't have time to go into it, but, but the US had lost control of, of, uh, of uh, Iran. And uh, Ethiopia, it's so another country where there had been a revolutionary movement led by uh, uh, students and, and uh, army officers that had taken the country into the, into the Soviet uh, orbit. The United States were worried that they were losing control of the whole areas of the world and they wanted to prevent um, uh, Afghanistan from, from, becoming, uh, f from becoming part of the, of the Soviet Union area of, uh, of influence. Interestingly, this insurgency was also backed by China uh, China funded the Islamic reactionary gangs that were fighting against the communist uh, government uh, and for a long period of time. From, from where? From Xinjiang, where, where now they're fighting uh, uh, Islamic in insurgency. Well, they, they were responsible for creating uh, this. And the reason for this is clear because the whole uh, foreign policy of China was the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so because the main enemy was the Soviet Union, then the friend was the United States. And they took the side of the United States in a whole number of uh, uh, conflicts around the world. Then in, in uh, December 1979, <clears throat> that is a year and a half after the revolution, the Soviet Union intervened. Why did the Soviet Union intervene? Uh, the Soviet Union did not intervene because of this Islamic insurgency. The real reason why the Soviet Union intervened is in order to settle scores within the factional struggle within the PDPA and defend the faction that they thought was more uh, compliant with the Soviet uh, Union. It was completely cynical intervention. It had nothing to do with the interests of the Afghan uh, uh, masses. Uh, in fact, <coughs> the factional struggle within the PDPA continued after they took power in 78. Taraki, from the Hulk uh, faction, sent Karmal to Czechoslovakia as an as a, uh, ambassador, but in fact this was an, an, a form of exile, having as far, as far away as, uh, as possible, because he thought that Karmal was conspiring with the Soviet Union to remove him. Uh, but then what happened was that Amin, the other leader of the Hulk faction, uh, started to become suspicious of Taraiki, and uh, because Taraki was being courted by the Soviet uh, Union and, and Amin started adopting a whole number of crazy uh, policies. In, in this very short period of time, 20,000 people were killed in these internal faction struggle, struggle faction fights within the, the Communist uh, Party. Uh, Amin organized the killing of Taraki. They were in, in the same faction, uh, but Amin was very, um, uh, he wanted power. And so he killed, uh, he removed uh, Taraki. And then, and then at that point, the Soviet Union said, enough is enough. This is a complete mess in, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. We want to keep control of this uh, strategic country. And the only way we, we're going to do it is through uh, Karmal, the leader of the Parcham uh, faction. So in 1979, in December, they sent troops in. Allegedly, Karmal from a position of power, had called the Soviet troops in. But in fact, he was in Tashkent, in Central Asia, in the Soviet Union, when he was uh, issuing this radio appeal for, for support and help from the Soviet Union. Soviet Union troops entered. They killed Amin 
and they installed Karmal to power. None of this has nothing to do with uh, revolution or progressive policies or helping the, the Afghan uh, people at all. And this is the reason why uh, our tendency, the militant tendency at that time, took a very clear position that we were not in favor of the Soviet invasion of uh, Afghanistan, which also had negative impacts in the communist movement worldwide. Because many, the, 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 the imperialist propaganda then said, look, I mean, you're talking about imperialism. What is the Soviet Union doing uh, invading, invading uh, Afghanistan? Obviously, they were completely hypocritical in the, in the criticism. But this, this did have an impact in the communist movement in many, in many countries. The communist movement was divided over this question of the Afghan uh, troops. There were splits in, in the parties, for instance, in Spain, uh, and so on. Uh, however, we also said, once the troops are in, uh, and this, then there is this uh, US-backed insurgency, it will be crazy to demand that the troops are withdrawn, because that will only help the Islamic uh, fundamentalists. This has completely changed the, the situation by the beginning of 1980. And we never demanded that the troops should be, should be withdrawn, because that, that will have meant the collapse of that uh, regime and, and the coming to power of, of, of uh, US-backed reactionary uh, black reaction uh, forces to, to power. The war lasted uh, 15 uh, years, and it has to be said that this, the Mujahideen, the so-called freedom fighters, as they were presented in the, in the West, they, they met. This was also the time when Reagan came to power with a more, a more belligerent foreign uh, policy, and this became a major casus belli, uh, Afghanistan. The US port millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in aid, which was channeled through the Pakistani secret services, through Saudi Arabia. And there were a whole number of foreign fighters who went to fight there. Amongst them, one Osama bin Laden. So Osama bin Laden, who, who then became a, a, a black beast of, of Islamic uh, terrorism for the United States, was in fact created by the United States during this 14-year war. And, and this was completely reactionary. These people had nothing, was nothing progressive in this, uh, in this war, which was also funded by the export and cultivation of narcotics, opium, which then becomes uh, heroin, played a major role in this, in this war. And this, these people, m many of them were using the, the cover of Islamic fundamentalism, but in reality they were just local warlords that were paid by the United States, by Pakistan, by, by Saudi Arabia, to carry out this, this war against the Soviets. The Soviets maintained their control of the country. They were not defeated militarily, but at one point they were so exhausted they were forced to leave. By 1986, Gorbachev came to power in, this, in the Soviet Union. He advocated reconciliation with uh, with the Mujahideen, with the Islamic reaction forces. Um, by 1988, he withdrew uh, military support. But that regime, which was then led by a man called Najibullah uh, from the Karmal, from the, from the Parcham faction of the PDPA, remained in power for another four years until 1992. It did have a certain base of uh, support and could resist, even without, U, uh, be, without Soviet Union support, it resisted for a few uh, years, but finally collapsed. And the collapse of the Najibullah regime in 92 is also very interesting because it happened when some of his main generals made an alliance with the reactionary Islamic uh, forces and went over, pretty much like what's happened uh, now. This seems to be like a tradition of military officers in the state apparatus just switching sides according to who's, who's uh, likely to, to win. Dostum, one of the, the then became a, a general in the Northern uh, Alliance, had been a member of the PD, PDPA. By this time, in any case, the PDPA had already introduced private property, had abolished most of the conquests of the Saur uh, revolution, had abandoned formally Marxist-Leninism, which it never really uh, espoused, and it was just a, a nationalist uh, party. It, it, then it then changed its name later on to uh, the Watan Party, the National Party, abandoning all talk of socialism or anything like this. And many of its leaders then beca became part of the Northern Alliance. So the, the United States could say they had won this war in 1992. Uh, but what, what uh, replaced 
the PDPA regime was a murderous alliance of uh, warlords that had fought this war for the United States imperialism, but then started fighting each other. Uh, and there was no unity at all amongst them. There was uh, ethnic cleansing of the Hazara in Kabul, um, ethnic conflicts between the different groups, the Uzbeks and the Tajiks against the Pashtuns, and so on. It was, it was a completely murderous regime. It was so much a murderous regime that then the Taliban came to power in 1996, and they had the backing of a large layers of the population. And on what grounds did they win? They win on the grounds of law and order. We're going to reestablish uh, some semblance of, of uh, normality where, where, where people have, uh, there, there, is, there is a law. The, uh, this law was very extreme form of Sharia law. But nevertheless, it, it meant that you, you knew you, you wouldn't be killed uh, randomly by this or, or that other faction. And so they, they won that war in 1996. Uh, this, where, where did the Taliban come from? The Taliban came from the same Mujahideen that had been backed and supported by US imperialism all along. In fact, their base was in Pakistan, and they were backed by the, by the ISI, the secret services in Pakistan, which have played their own card, not necessarily the card of the United States imperialism, but sometimes coinciding in their in the aims. And the Taliban were quite happy to have Al Qaeda in, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. And this was the excuse, if you want, that led to the 2001 invasion. After the, the Twin Towers attack in Sept on September the 11th, 2001, the United States had been wounded. The most Im I powerful imperialist country on Earth had suffered an attack on its own soil. Thousands of people uh, were dead, and they needed to show the world that they still were in, in business, that they were still ruling the world, and they needed to invade a couple of countries. They picked Iraq, which had nothing to do with Al-Qaeda or with the September 11th uh, attack, but they thought it was, it was an easy target, one that they left more or less unfinished in the previous uh, invasion. And then they picked uh, Afghanistan. They said to Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban, they said, you have to give up, have to give up uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, Osama bin Laden or else. And he said, well, I'm not giving them up and else was military invasion. And that military invasion was uh, as all military invasions of Afghanistan in, in the past. It seemed, it seemed to go well. In a couple of years, they controlled large parts of the territory, the main cities. They installed a, a puppet uh, government, first under Karzai and then under Ghani. But they didn't control the, the country. The Taliban's were not defeated. They just uh, retreated into the mountain uh, uh, hideouts into Pakistan, where they were backed and, and supported by the, by the ISI. In fact, if you remember, some of you might remember, when Osama bin Laden was finally uh, apprehended and killed, where was he? He wasn't in Afghanistan, he was in Pakistan. He was being protected by the, by the ISI. Uh, and so, yeah, they, 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 this, war, this, this war that they just now lost started very well, as, as many wars in Afghanistan start by, by imperialist powers. But they never, they never managed to get full control of the, of the country. And what they created was a puppet regime that had no other base of support or legitimacy than, than the military presence of imperialist powers. I'm talking about the United States all the time, but of course uh, the United Kingdom, uh, our own uh, British government was also heavily involved in this, and other uh, governments were also involved. But obviously they played the main, uh, the main role. Now, what's going to happen now? The, the Taliban are in power. The Taliban have said that they, that they are different from what they were in, in 96. Uh, many people remember the Taliban rule in 96, and they, they don't, they're not particularly fond of that. This was extremely reactionary uh, rule, uh, the, 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 a very strict interpretation of tribal law and, and Sharia, extreme interpretation of Sharia law. And they have promised that they're not going to be, they're not going to do the same. It's also true that the Taliban leaders in the, in the last 20 years have been mainly based abroad, some of them in the, in the United Arab Emirates, some of them in Pakistan, they have traveled the world, they have attended peace conferences and negotiations. And basically, they, in reality, they're not so interested in, in Islamic uh, law or fundamentalism. They just want to rule the country uh, according to their, to their whim. 
And they understand that in order to rule the country, they need to be amenable to foreign powers. They don't want to be subject to foreign powers, but they want to be able to negotiate with different foreign powers. Right now, the, the reserves of the Bank of Afghanistan are based in New York. So for starters, they need that money. They need the money from the aid in order to feed the, the people. So it is true, possibly, that some of the Taliban leaders have become more statesmen-like. Uh, and they will like uh, to be left alone to rule uh, Afghanistan and to have deals with different uh, countries. They have gone uh, to other countries with Islamic uh, governments, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, and they see that that, that works. You know, I mean, in Saudi Arabia, there's, there's a strict Islamic uh, rule, and at the same time, they're friends with the United States. So some of them might be thinking, why is that not possible in, in Afghanistan? And the United States wouldn't be uh, uh, contrary to, to that if they could reach uh, an agreement. In fact, as you've seen, in the last few weeks, there's been a lot of talk about the plight of women in uh, Afghanistan and, and how the defeat of the US imperialist intervention has meant that the, 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 the women's rights that have been achieved in this period are now completely destroyed and so on. But this is all talk. Uh, US imperialism doesn't care a iota for, for women's rights or for human rights in Afghanistan or anywhere else. Otherwise, they will have started a war in Saudi Arabia, which is the main uh, ally in uh, the Middle East and one of the main recipients of uh, foreign aid and military aid. So that, that doesn't count for them. The plight of uh, women in Afghanistan, the plight of, of the poor in Afghanistan is very real, but has nothing to do. Uh, I mean, in the last 20 years, if this regime had been a progressive regime that they had installed, people would have been prepared to fight for it, to defend it. Uh, and this was clearly not the, not the case. Uh, but one thing is the leaders of the Taliban and another thing is the, is the Taliban fighters on the ground. This is a, a, a motley coalition of uh, different warlords with different interests. It's true that the Taliban have now been able to go beyond the traditional base amongst the Pushtuns. They have gotten support from certain sections uh, amongst the Uzbeks, the Tajiks. Even they made openings to the Hazara Shia, which they have mistreated in the, in the past. They want to uh, attempt to form a government that's more or less stable and can get foreign uh, aid. But this is by no means guaranteed. There are already f faction fights within the Taliban government. There's the, the Haqqani network, which the, the CIA very well described as a, as, a, as, a, as a criminal organization disguised as Islamic fundamentalists. But, but they are all like that. Uh, this is no, no surprise. And they are fighting against other factions. And the whole thing is likely to descend again into, into fighting uh, between different uh, warlords and, and different um, factions backed by different imperialist uh, powers. China is now attempting to muscle in. Not that they wanted this result particularly, but China wants some stability. And if they can uh, negotiate and talk with, uh, with the Taliban, so be it. The Taliban, for instance, have made a gesture towards China by removing the, the, the um, how is it called, the, the, uh, the, the East Turkmenistan um, something army. Is, is that how it's called? I think they have another name now, the Tur Turkmenistan Islamic Party or something. And th these are the Islamic terrorists that are operating in Xinjiang. And they are based in Afghanistan. So the Taliban have now removed them. But what does it mean removed? They, they removed them from the border, they moved them somewhere else. Uh, and it, as a gesture towards China, China's muscling in, Russia's muscling in, and this is the plight of the Afghan people for the last hundreds of uh, years. Imperialist powers intervening and meddling into the internal affairs and not allowing any progressive forces to emerge from, uh, from the country where they are, they have a base. Uh, and, and, and this is what I will uh, say just to, just to finish. The two things, one, the defeat of US imperialism in, in Afghanistan has wide ranging consequences. Many other regimes in the region and far beyond will now see that, uh, that being allied to the United States is not a guarantee for staying in power. And that's a dangerous thing at a time when other will be imperialist regimes are, are, are rising, China, Russia, and so on. Um, and number two, the only solution for the Afghan people, for the workers, for the women, for the peasants of Afghanistan is revolution. 
But revolution in Afghanistan in the last instance depends also on revolution in the neighboring countries. Revolution in Pakistan, revolution in uh, Russia, revolution in Iran, at the very least, revolution in China, revolution in India, uh, is not a matter that can be solved only within the borders of Afghanistan uh, for many different uh, reasons. But, but the main one is, is this, this intermix of different national groups and this uh, strategic position that Afghanistan plays in this geographic uh, area, which uh, makes it prone to imperialist powers uh, intervening. If Afghanistan was anywhere else, maybe imperialist powers wouldn't be so uh, worried, we'll leave them alone. But this is not the case. Therefore, the revolution in Afghanistan, which has roots in Afghanistan, this is not an, an outside imposed uh, movement. Uh, there's a strong communist tradition. Uh, and some people, I mean, this is a long time ago, but some people remember fondly the days when the communists were in, uh, in uh, power because of the benefits they got from that uh, regime. This communist tradition needs to be revived uh, on the basis also of an analysis of the mistakes of that uh, government and that uh, regime. And the struggle of the Afghan people needs to be linked to this struggle of workers and peasants in, in Pakistan, in Russia, in Iran, and all the neighboring uh, countries, in Central Asia, in China, and, and so on.